Good morning, everybody out in the parking lot. Good morning, good morning. My name is Liz. If we have not met yet, I am introducing the service today, and I'm a guest worship leader here. Um, we're all so excited to be here. Um, I'm very excited to see you all. I have not been able to worship with you guys in person yet, so this is super exciting. Um, I'm just going to point out, oh, we lost Caleb. Caleb is going to be at that, oh, there he is, that little table right over there. And he has coloring pages for any kids that want to go grab those or adults that want to go grab those. I unashamedly color a lot. It helps me focus. So if you want to head over there quick right now and grab those for anyone that wants them while we're just starting out, or you can do it as you feel that you need to. Um, this morning I woke up and... I had this new song running through my head. Um, it's by Shane and Shane, and it comes from Psalm 90. So our call to worship today, I just wanted to read a couple of verses from it. Uh, so Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. And then just jumping down to verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So that's our prayer as we start this morning, that the Lord would satisfy us and that we would know of his great love and the satisfaction that we find in him alone. So I'm just going to open up in prayer, and then we're going to start with some songs this morning. So if you guys can all pray with me, that would be great. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can just gather here together in person outdoors. We thank you for the lovely weather, and um, we thank you that you satisfy us. Um, we just pray that this morning we would hear from your word through the preaching um, and the teaching uh, that Pastor Matt will bring to us. And I pray that we would be diligent to live for you um, in all we say and do, not only today, uh, but in every day that comes in the week ahead. And I just pray that our hearts would be fixed upon you today um, and that we would sing to you the King of Kings who is above all and fix our eyes on you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you are able and would like, I'd invite you guys to stand up and to sing along. We're going to start by singing Above All Together. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things. Above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, lay behind a stone, you live to die, 
rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above. above all again above all powers above all kings above all nature and all created things above all wisdom and all the ways of man you were here before the world Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all. Sing crucified again. Crucified, lay behind the stone. Rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all. Like a rose, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall thought of me above so the next song we're going to be singing is take my life and I just need to unclip things because they blow away
can all be seated. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Awesome, awesome. How are you all doing this morning? Excited to be outside? Wow. All right, so for you kids out here, this month, or actually last month and this month, we've been learning about the theme of confidence. So that's a, that's a big thing. That's so important because people try to find their confidence in so many other places, and yet we need to ground our confidence in the right place as Christians. And so this week especially, we're learning the importance of staying focused on Jesus. And that's why I'm wearing these funny glasses right here. They're cool because they help me stay focused uh, for many of you who have glasses that help you see better, I know I'm wearing actually contact lenses as well. They help me stay focused so that I can drive, so that I can know where I'm going, and so that I can see what is actually in front of me. And so that's what our key point is this week, stay focused on Jesus. And as you check on our website, maybe later or sometime uh, today, you can check out and you'll see that our lesson this week on our website is about uh, Peter and how Peter was able to walk on water just for a short bit before getting distracted and falling because he was not focused on Jesus in those moments. He was distracted by the waves and what was going on around him. And so I actually just have a, a short, small illustration. I was hoping to find a bigger pinwheel, but we have this right here. And so we have this, and I love pinwheels because I used to play with these all the time as a kid. And the cool thing about this is it just spins around with the wind. And as an illustration, kids, when you see this and you want to just stay focused, it's easy to go and just kind of get distracted by what's going on on the outside. It's a little bit hypnotizing, actually. And so essentially, many times as an illustration, when it comes to our lives, we get distracted just like Peter does. We get distracted by all the changes and what's going on around us. And yet a good thing to know about the pinwheel is there's one point in the pinwheel that is stable as everything else is spinning around, and that's the central point right here, that's where this black dot is. And you kind of see this as an illustration maybe uh, for your cars as well on your wheels. You have the central point that everything pivots around. And many times we can get distracted by what's going on on the outside and we can kind of really constantly uh, be in a little bit of chaos as we're confused as to what's going on. And yet when we focus on the center, when we focus on what actually matters, then we can have that strong point of stability. And for us in Christianity, that is Jesus. He is the one we're supposed to stay focused on because ultimately he is not going to fail us. He is strong. He is where we can find our confidence and our foundation. So if you want to learn more about this lesson this week, please check it out on our website. We have tons 
of amazing resources on our kids page as we learn more about Peter this week. So one thing I want to mention before I take a moment to pray before Pastor Matt comes up and preaches the word, I just want to mention that we aren't going to have an official program for the kids today, but we're going to have a place in the side. We have a campfire pit and we have a place on the side of the building that we would encourage maybe parents if you want to take your children to during the service if they have some energy that they need to burn off. That's not going to be supervised by us, but we want to just recommend that one or both parents are there supervising the children just to make sure that they're safe and that they're okay. So I just want to throw that off there. And later this summer, we're going to hopefully open up some more programs outdoors so that the kids can learn more about Jesus as you guys are learning more about God's word here out in the parking lot as well. So just so you know and that you're aware of that. Now, just before Matt comes up, I'm just going to take a moment to pray. Lord God, thank you for this morning and thank you for this wonderful day that we're able to be out here outside. It's just a wonderful opportunity to study your word, to learn more about you, and to get excited about what you're doing. As we're continuing on this series, Encounters with Jesus, we learn more about uh, what that really means. And God, I just pray that as we learn more about you, as Matt preaches your truth this morning, that we may be drawn closer to you and that we may fall more and more in love with you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Caleb. And uh, so good to be here this morning. So good to see all of you. And this is just a, a beautiful morning when we stop and think about it. Like you're here. It's a Sunday morning in July and you're at church and we're singing praise to Jesus together. I mean, this is, uh, as we sang last week, it's a foretaste of glory divine. It's a little bit of a snapshot of the fullness of joy that awaits us. Um, I'm a little bit extra excited because I've got some coverage this morning here, although I might, uh, I might move out a little bit if I can do that. I don't know if that's going to, okay, I'm going to step out into the sunshine. I did put sunscreen on this morning. Last week, I kind of cooked the old dome on top, felt it, and that wasn't good. Um, so hopefully any shine you see on me today is more the glory of the Lord than the, the scalp cooking, Okay. But uh, so good to be together, and we're continuing on in our summer series, uh, Encounters with Jesus. We're we're taking these summer months to journey through the Gospels and see these different conversations, these different encounters that our Lord has with different types of people. And if you were here last Sunday, uh, you'll you'll remember that I mentioned we're making a bit of a shift now that we're into July, where we're, uh, we're dealing with some people who are a little bit more prominent, people who hold a little bit more power within society at the time. And so last week, we looked at the faith of the Roman centurion. We saw how Jesus was amazed by his faith. And uh, today, we're going to go into the Gospel of Matthew again in Matthew chapter 19 to look at the encounter between Jesus and the rich young man. So this is, uh, this is where we are. Um, this is one of those encounters that, uh, as you look at the Gospels, there, there are multiple accounts. The different Gospel writers give their different accounts. And so you can actually read about this particular exchange in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 10, and then in Luke as well, Luke chapter 18. And so I'd encourage you to maybe just jot that down if you're taking notes or just make a mental note to, to read those passages maybe later on today or later on in the week. Um, But we're going to be in Matthew today, and I'm going to begin our time simply by reading the first half of the section. I'm going to read verses 16 to 22, and then I'll take a moment to pray for our time here together, and then we'll work our way through the rest of the passage together. So, if you've got a Bible or a Bible app uh, on a device that you've got handy, you can follow along with me. If not, you can just listen and hear the word of the Lord. Here we are. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, What good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, 
go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's take a moment to pray here. Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day that you have given to us in your goodness and in your kindness and in your grace. And Lord, thank you for the moments we've already shared together this morning, moments of praise and worship to lift high the name of Jesus, to reflect on on who he is, what he has done for us. And I, I pray, Lord, that as we continue on now in these moments in worship, that we would pause just right now to know that we can trust you because you are the source of truth. To know that you are, um, you are worthy of our worship. You are deserving of our praise. And so out of that place of, of trust and worship as we come to your word, we pray that you would speak to us in these moments. We pray that you would help us to, to wrestle with areas of our lives where maybe we're not as clear. Maybe we're not as content. Maybe we don't feel uh, a, a fullness of joy. And so in these moments, Lord, I pray that, that you, would, you would use me uh, to, to speak clearly and boldly, that the authority of your word would go forward here, and that it would accomplish the purposes that you set out for it in this very hour. So Lord, we love you and thank you for the opportunity to be together here. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the last couple of years, uh, different journalists have sought out some of the uh, more wealthy people, some of the wealthiest people in the world to uh, get a little bit of snapshot into their lives and what makes them tick, and also what makes them happy. People who have all kinds of money, what the greatest source of their happiness is. And so I got a few quotes here. Uh, One is from Richard Branson, who apparently this morning he's getting blasted off into space. I don't know if you guys heard about that at all, but he's the founder, the CEO of Virgin, and, uh, and he's done all kinds of crazy things in his life, and very wealthy, successful businessman, an astronaut now apparently. But uh, he said this, I know I'm fortunate to live an extraordinary life and that most people would assume my business success and the wealth that comes with it have brought me happiness. But they haven't. In fact, it's the reverse. Word from Warren Buffett, he's one of the most successful investors of our time. He said, relying on money to make you happy just doesn't work. Even $1 million will not make you happy because your happiness will disappear when you look around and see someone who has $2 million. And Bill Gates, who of course has been at the top or near the top of the list of the world's wealthiest people for close to 30 years, probably more than that by now, um, he's also known for giving away much of his wealth. He's given away billions of dollars to charity over the years. Uh, Speaking about giving, he said, the most amazing philanthropists are the people who are actually making a significant sacrifice. And so hearing it from uh, some of the people who have a lot of money, uh, they make it sound like the money isn't really what makes you happy. It's not really what makes you happy. And uh, I I think of a scene from one of my favorite movies, uh, the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. And uh, it's, it's, I watch it, I try to watch it pretty much every year at Christmas time. My family used to always watch it every Christmas. And uh, if you're familiar with the story at all, there's this one scene where George Bailey, he's played by Jimmy Stewart, uh, is encountering his guardian angel who's been sent from heaven to earth to, uh, to take care of him and to help him. And uh, George, of course, is distraught that earlier in the day, his uncle misplaced a a significant amount of money. And so Clarence, his guardian angel, is speaking to him and kind of asks, you know, how we can help. And and George says, you don't happen to have 8,000 bucks lying around, do you? And uh, Clarence reminds him, well, no, we don't actually use money in heaven. We have no use for it. And there's a brief pause. (laughs) And then uh, George Bailey or Jimmy Stewart in his Jimmy Stewart way says, well, it comes in pretty handy down here, bub. It's, uh, I love that line. It doesn't make you happy, but it comes in handy. And I think sometimes the lines become blurred between the happiness and the handiness. A handiness and happiness, and then even happiness and joy. We believe, if you're a follower of Jesus, that he increases your joy, that he multiplies your joy. And part of that multiplication of joy comes through our understanding of what is ours and what's, what's truly not ours and what becomes his. So that's where this is going. And so moments ago, we read about this rich young man. 
the, uh, the other gospel accounts describe him as a rich young ruler. It's quite likely that he's a Pharisee, but we know from Matthew's text that he is rich. It says in verse 22 that he has many possessions, and we know that he's young. It says that in verse 20. And he addresses Jesus as teacher. That's how the Pharisees often interacted with Jesus. They saw him as a, as a teacher of some type. They didn't necessarily bl- believe he was God, but they saw him as teacher. And he comes up to Jesus and he asks the question, teacher, what must I do? What good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? That's verse 16. Now, if you stop and think about this with me for a moment, a- at first glance, this has to be one of the, the lowest hanging fruits in terms of a gospel conversation someone could possibly ever have. He's basically saying, how do I get to heaven, right? So this, this one's a, a, a pretty easy one in terms of the gospels and all of scripture. And even you've talked about someone who's ready to just kind of walk through that gospel booklet or, or pray the prayer or, or go forward at the end of the church service. This, is, this seems to be where this young man is coming from. What must I do? How do I get to heaven? Now, if it were me, <laughs> I'd kind of do something like that. I'd share the gospel with him and then rejoice that he seems to be eager to receive it. But Jesus doesn't do that. It's amazing to see what he does here. He does not go down that path. And this shows us yet again just on how different a level Jesus is in terms of engaging the hearts and minds of people. It shows us the, 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 different, the different way he goes, the different path he takes. This is amazing evangelism here. So Jesus, in response to the question, he asks the question himself. He says, why do you call me good? Why are you calling me good? Now, our our Muslim friends try to use this verse. They kind of pounce on this verse and use it as kind of a a gotcha to to say that that Jesus isn't actually God and and that that this verse is proof that he's denying his deity. But if you think about it, actually what Jesus is doing, he's not denying his deity. He's affirming his deity in these moments as he's talking to this young man to say, okay, only God is good. So if you're calling me good, you're, what you're really saying is that I'm God. You're, you're saying that, that I'm the fulfillment of the law. If you're really serious about entering the kingdom of heaven, you're calling me good. Are you ready to do that? And so he says in verse 17, if you would enter life, in other words, if you would enter the kingdom, if you want to receive that eternal life, then he says, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Now, Jesus is not saying here that only keeping the commandments and upholding the law is what gets you into heaven. Doing good works is not what gets us to heaven, all right? What he is doing is he's meeting this young man where he's at. Because if he is a Pharisee, if he's educated in the law, um, this this is the language he speaks. This is someone who's probably obsessed with with doing good works all the time. It's performance-based. This is legalism. And this is how this man lives his life. And so it's from that angle that Jesus is leading him on a path of discovery. So he's not saying, hey, you receive eternal life by being a full-blown legalist (laughs) and, and just obsessing over that, fixating all that you do on keeping the commandments. But what he is saying is that obedience is the outward expression of an inward professed faith, a faith in God. Remember, faith and works, they are not at odds with one another. It's not one or the other, but faith comes first. Faith comes first. Faith is what prompts the works. You might recall as a church family, we went through the book of James earlier this year, and we went, we went through that passage where James says, show me your faith. Faith without works is dead. And so there's that relationship there, but the faith comes first. And so this is what Jesus is doing. He's engaging this young man with familiar language. Clearly it piques his interest because in verse 18, the young man says, hey, okay, which ones? Toss out a commandment at me. Which ones are you talking about? I, I bet I'm doing okay here. I'm pretty good at keeping these commandments. Which ones did you have in mind there, Jesus? And so Jesus gives him some from the Ten Commandments. Uh, actually, six, seven, eight, nine, and five. He gives in that order. And then he gives the, uh, the second part of the greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he, that he's, that's what he lays out. Now, in our brokenness, uh, you and I, we would think, okay, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> I'm, I probably, if this is the requirement to make it to heaven probably not going to cut it for me. May- maybe not these, these explicit commandments as they're laid out in the Old Testament, but we would recall that earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus ups the ante. He says, you know, you have heard it was said, but now I say to you. And so he's raising the bar to show not just the, the outward expression and the outward obedience, but the inner obedience, the heart issues. And so we might think to ourselves, okay, 
I can't keep up. If this is, if this is all that's required, I can't maintain this pace. I, I can't make it into heaven. I'm lost. I'm up the creek. But interestingly, this young man does not say any of that. Although this probably should have stopped, made him stop to think, man, I don't know. This is, this is a bit of a head scratcher here. He, he doubles down. And so he says in verse 20, all these I have kept. <laughs> I, I'm doing okay. I'm keeping the law. But then he asks the question in the second part of verse 20, what do I still lack? What do I still lack? Looks like I appear to be on the fast track to heaven if this is all there really is. And yet there's some doubt there. There's a seed of doubt. Some uncertainty. I'm lacking something. Why is that? Why don't I feel full? Why don't I feel complete? Have you ever had those moments where maybe you've checked all those boxes, so to speak? You, you've, you've lived up to the standards, whether your own or standards of the world, some standards that have been imposed upon you, and you've done it all, and yet you're still not feeling complete. You're still not feeling, even though you should be at the top of the mountain, so to speak, you, you don't feel like you're there. Uh, today's the final day at Wimbledon. The, the men's final has probably just started, so I commend you for being here at church and not staying home to watch that. Maybe some of you tennis fans are doing the PVR thing. Um, I'm not as much of a tennis fan, so I'm, I'm, I'd rather be here at church. But um, I, I read a quote a number of years back from uh, Andre Agassi, one of the greatest uh, men's uh, tennis players of all time, uh, a quote that he gave uh, after he'd won Wimbledon. He won Wimbledon once, and uh, here's what he said. They say my victory at Wimbledon forces them to reassess me and to reconsider who I really am. But I don't feel that it's changed me. I feel, in fact, as if I've been let in on a dirty little secret. Winning changes nothing. Now that I've won a slam, I know something that very few people on earth are permitted to know. A win doesn't feel as good as a loss feels bad. And the good feeling doesn't last as long as the bad, not even close. A reporter phones me up and I tell him that I'm happy about the ranking and it feels good to be the best that I can be. It's a lie. This isn't at all what I feel. It's what I want to feel. It's what I expected to feel and what I tell myself to feel. But in fact, I feel nothing. In verse 21, Jesus says, if you would be perfect, hey, if you're doing okay with, with keeping all these laws, he then says, go and sell all, all that you possess. Sell it all and give it to the poor. And make no mistake, as a good Pharisee, this man would have already donated some of his wealth to charity. The, the Pharisees were, were on top of this as well. The giving of alms, that is, you know, the donating to, to the less fortunate, to, to charity, um, that was something that they did fairly regularly. But the, the motivation for them in that, of course, was the public uh, accolades that came as a result. People would commend them for their generosity. And so the, the heart motivation wasn't to help the people in need. It was to be getting the, the applause and the, the pats on the back. And so on the outside, for this young man, it all checks out. Everything looks good. For a young Pharisee, this guy's doing really well with everything. But yet he's asking the question, what do I lack? Because he's not feeling complete. There's an absence of joy. And so Jesus, picking on the, up on that, he dives beneath the surface. Let's talk about the heart issue now. Let's deal with your heart, Jesus says. In the second part of that verse, Jesus shows the, uh, the outcome of these proposed action steps. Here's what's going to happen. You will have treasure in heaven. And that's a worthwhile investment. We know earlier on in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So he's saying, this, this, this is the invitation. And the invitation comes with a challenge. Sell all that you have. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Sounds pretty good. And I believe this shows us more of not only how Jesus uh, engages people at an individual heart level, how he, how he interacts with what's going on in their very lives, but also how he challenges us, this young man and certainly us as well, to understand that there's no half-heartedness in following him. When you pledge allegiance to Jesus as king, when you call him the Lord of your life, then there's no turning back. Uh, the, the, there's, this is a significant, this is that significant sacrifice that Bill Gates is speaking of. But the payoff the return is immense. It's of immeasurable worth. We might not always understand it. We might not always see it playing out the way we expect it to. But the payoff is immense. Jesus is always worth it. It is that fullness, that multiplication of our joy. But how does the young man respond? Well, verse 22 tells us that he went away sorrowful. 
He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. And, and so that's the inner turmoil. On the outside, everything looks good, but on the inside, when push comes to shove, the answer to the question that I'm asking in verse 16, what must I do to receive an eternal life? That reveals my heart struggle. That reveals my stumbling blocks, my barriers. So for the young man, the struggle is between that desire to inherit eternal life and the desire to enjoy wealth and possessions in this life. And at that moment, he leaves dejectedly because where his treasure is, sorry, where his heart is, is with his earthly treasure. So let's keep going here because there's more to this passage. And, and after this exchange, Jesus turns this into a teaching opportunity. The moment is gone with the young man, but the moment is beginning with the disciples. And so here at verses 23 and 24, he says this. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, somewhere along the way, I'm not sure when this happened, a, a popular teaching emerged that, uh, that suggested that, that people um, in understanding the statement thought that this was a reference to a physical location, uh, that, that one of the gates on the city walls of Jerusalem was referred to as the eye of the needle. And so the thinking was that, that you know, camels would have to stoop down, kind of bend their, their necks and get on their knees and go, go under the city gate to get into the city. Um, now, I'll, I'll give some credit here. That's, that's more creative than just calling it, you know, the, the north gate or the west gate, to call it the eye of the needle, right? You've got, you know, the eye of the hurricane and the eye of the tiger, and over there is the eye of the needle, right? Um, so that, th if that actually happened, that's kind of cool. I don't think that was the case. But the legend suggests that these camels would have to stoop down and go through this gate. But what that teaching does is it softens what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus isn't saying that it's, it's kind of an awkward and difficult thing for someone to be saved on, on their own accomplishments, on their own merit, on their upholding of the law. What he's saying is it's impossible. Because think about it. Picture, picture a sewing needle, right? It's pretty tiny to begin with. The, the eye of the needle, the little loop that the thread goes through is even tinier. And picture a camel. <laughs> they're, they're big kind of awkward creatures, uh, they drool, they spit, they move funny. Like for that to go through the eye of a needle, it's impossible, right? And so Jesus is saying it's, it's actually easier for one of these creatures to go through there than for someone who is consumed by their treasure, consumed by the pursuit of, of wealth, consumed by their never-ending pursuit of material gain to enter the kingdom. That that's always going to serve as a barrier, now, he's not, say, he's not saying here that rich people cannot be saved. He's not saying that rich people can't put their trust in Jesus and live their lives for him. Um, but what will save them is not their self-sufficiency. What will save them is, is not their pride in their possessions. It'll be an understanding that the only thing that will get them into that relationship, the only thing that gets them the one purchase that they can never make is what Jesus has done for them, the propitiation for their sin, that atoning sacrifice. His blood that was shed, that is the only currency that they can use in order to receive eternal life. That is the only currency that marks us as clear and accepted and redeemed. And so that's what comes next here. Look at verses 25 and 26. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The disciples are thinking, man, this young guy that you just sent away, Jesus, he's a total model of, of you know, an upstanding citizen. Young guy who's keeping the commandments, giving to charity, he's, he's doing great stuff. But Jesus has exposed what's going on in his heart, what's happening beneath the surface, and so he goes away. So then the disciples are kind of thinking, shoot, <laughs> what hope is there for any, other, any of us around here? And that's why Jesus' response in verse 26 is so encouraging. It's to encourage the disciples. It's not going to be this man's working himself out of the jam. It will be man's faith in God's saving work that allows him to be saved. And we know that there are many good and godly people who are blessed with wealth and different treasures of different types in, in this world and in this life. They're using it for kingdom purposes. And, and, and even in the Gospels, we see stories of those individuals who, uh, who had wealth um, and the Lord worked in their heart. And actually, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler alert that uh, next week we're going to interact with a specific encounter that Jesus had with one of those individuals. But with God, all things are possible. God can get that camel through the needle, so to speak. But it's going to be a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to convict and to transform a human heart, to get from that place of pride 
to storing up treasure in heaven. And so in light of that last statement, Jesus says, with, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Uh, Peter, as he often does, Peter's the first one to speak. He pipes up here and, and he speaks out. And so look at verse 27. He says, Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? It's almost like a moment of self-pity for him there. You know, we, we've left everything behind here. Maybe, maybe this is a, a mini crisis of faith that he's having. He's saying, Lord, okay, we've, we've done this. Not that we ever had that much wealth, but, but we've left our stuff behind. And the very first week in this series, we looked at that particular encounter. After the miraculous catch of fish, it said Peter and James and John, they left their nets. They left their fishing nets behind, and they followed Jesus. And so Peter's asking here, man, what's in it for us? <laughs> what, what will we have? What do we get? Is this really all worth it? I wonder if we sometimes ask that question. We wonder, is it really worth it? Lord, we've, I've given this up in my life, or I got rid of this. Is this really going to be worth it? Where I'm sitting right now, I've put an awful lot into this thing, whether it's time or, or money or, or people relationships. I'm not so sure that the payoff is, is going to pay out here. I, I don't see it. It's not all that clear right now. And I love that this encounter has turned into a teaching moment. Read what Jesus says here. Just we'll, we'll finish up the passage here, verses 28 through 30. This sets us up for our closing thoughts here. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Notice that Jesus does not rebuke Peter for saying what he said as, as Peter has that, that moment of kind of crisis, that, that moment of doubt maybe. Jesus doesn't rebuke him there. And so what that tells you and I is that it's okay to question God. It's okay to wrestle sometimes with, with, with these hard things. The Lord wants us to come to him in those moments. He can handle it. He's, he's good that way. <laughs> if he's calling us to make a sacrifice, he's, he's probably expecting to hear from us. So instead, Jesus affirms Peter. He affirms the other disciples. He says, in the new world, the, the Greek word there is talking about the regeneration. That's when all things have been restored. This is stuff out of the book of Revelation. Jesus says, you will be right there with me. And you will, you will judge. You will have 12 thrones to judge. You will govern with me. That's what verse 28 is saying. And then in verse 29, he gives this, this exhortation, this affirmation to Peter and to the disciples, but also to us as well. He says, everyone who's left behind the source of their joy, everyone who leaves behind the things that they seemingly treasure the most in this life, whether it's property or, or people relationships, different possessions, different family members, whatever it is that they have to give up in order to come and follow me. I'm going to more than make up whatever loss they feel in that moment. That sense of loss will be erased. And I'll make it up and their joy will multiply. It will increase. It will be a hundredfold. And in saying that, Jesus isn't saying we have to abandon all those things entirely because we, we love the life we have. We, we love our families and, and the good things of this, this world that God has blessed us with to enjoy. But, but what it is saying, what he is saying here, is those things are, are left behind in that they, they don't become the top priority in our life. Once we meet Jesus, he becomes the top priority. Those other things are all secondary to him. And Jesus makes up for that sense of loss we might feel in the moment of giving up first place to those things to give first place to him. Because joy is multiplied in giving ourselves to him. He gave it all for us. And so when we realize that, when we truly want to, to give our greatest, when we want to give our best to him, he becomes the treasure. He becomes the portion and the prize. And so the rich young man, it's interesting, we kind of see it as he was called away from his treasures. But Jesus was calling him to more treasure, Right? He, he thought, man, I, I have to leave all this stuff behind. But Jesus was trying to get him to see there's so much more waiting for you if you would just come and follow me. It's going to cost you to do it, but come and follow me. The reward, the reward of following. The rewards, <laughs> if you're in Christ, the reward system, the members rewards, uh, they've already begun. I was talking to someone a couple weeks ago about a particular uh, brand of uh, hotels, a hotel chain that they've uh, been a long time uh, member with. And so when they travel, they, they get all these perks and benefits. And it uh, sounds pretty nice, some of the upgrades you can get when you're a, a long time member and platinum level and all these good things. 
But the rewards begin the moment you receive Jesus and ask him into your life, and they only increase over time. The moment you invite him into your life, there are some pretty good perks for, for beginners, for new members. You receive that assurance of salvation. You receive that, that hope of eternal life. You receive the promise of the Holy Spirit as a permanent presence within you. You receive that inheritance of, of being adopted into the kingdom of God Almighty, to be brought into a family with brothers and sisters. You receive that hope of eternal life. And so that moment when you do that, when you confess your sin, you believe that Jesus lived the life that you and I could not, that he died the death that we deserve, took the punishment for the sin in our lives. He took that upon himself. And he died a brutal death. He received the judgment and he received physical anguish. He experienced that. But then he rose again. His resurrection proved that death can be defeated, that sin can be defeated, that we can be restored and be made new and brought into relationship with him. The rewards program just, just takes off. Beyond those startup rewards, the rewards program continues over time. As we get to know Jesus more, as we grow in our relationship with him through, through uh, reading about him in, in his word and, and spending time with him in prayer and, and connecting in a church family with other brothers and sisters and learning from them and their experiences and serving in the church, using the gifts that God's blessed us with to, to bless other people, to, to share the hope that we have with people who don't yet know about it, to share the gospel with people around us. When we give of, of our time and of our talents and of our treasure, all those things, the rewards just continue. The joy just increases. It just multiplies, and it's just a hint of the greater rewards that await for us in eternity. So this is what Jesus says. If you leave it all behind to follow me, you'll receive a hundredfold. You will inherit the eternal life. That's the hope that we hold, and as followers of Jesus, that's what we look forward to. We live in light of eternity, and that's what gets us through uh, a pandemic. <laughs> that's, that's what sees us through a period of, of uncertainty in our lives. That's what sees us through the challenges and the hardships and, and the, the sickness and the struggles and the addictions and the anxieties and the doubts. That hope is what will see us through because Jesus brings that fullness of joy. So as we wrap up this morning, I'll invite uh, Liz and, and Josiah and Kim. You guys can come back forward here. Um, just a simple question to, to reflect upon in light of our, our teaching this encounter today. What might Jesus be asking you to give up today? What is he asking you to give up today? What, what area of your life, maybe it's, if you really think about it, on the outside it looks okay, but on the inside this is what's holding first place in your life. Maybe you're not aware of it, but maybe in this moment in hearing this passage, the word of God is going forward and, and the Holy Spirit is, is convicting you. Maybe there's something that is holding first place. It's serving as your treasure right now. Maybe if, if you had to leave it behind, your inclination would be to experience sorrow if that were expected of you to leave it. I want to encourage you that when Jesus asks you to, to give that up, he's not calling you away from joy. He's calling you to more and greater joy the fullness of joy, the completion of joy. And again, it might not play out the way we expect it to with our limited, finite human perspective, but the payoff is still immense. By faith, we believe that. What is it that he's asking you to give up? You know, it's interesting to note that the comment that he makes right at the end of this passage in verse 30, it says, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And that statement actually serves as a little bit of a bridge into the parable that he shares in chapter 20. But it's also coming, I believe, on the heels of these two encounters. So he's engaged with this rich young man and with the disciples. But even before that, the passage right before what we looked at this morning, there's this scene where uh, children are coming to Jesus and the disciples are saying, no, you know, he doesn't have time for you. Stay away. And Jesus rebukes the disciples and says, let the little children come to me. For theirs is the kingdom. They will inherit the kingdom. And so in light of all this, Jesus says, hey, the first, the people we think of who would be first in line, this prominent rich man, this young man, they still have a little bit of soul wrestling to do. They still have some business to do with God. Doesn't mean they can't make it, but they have to do a bit of that business first. On the other hand, the children, who sometimes are thought of as last in line, Jesus says, to them belongs the kingdom of heaven. They will come first. And so Jesus wants you and I to come to him with that childlike faith. That childlike faith, trusting that he is good, that he can be trusted no matter what. And so whatever it is that he calls us to give up, treasure, whatever the treasure might be, he can be trusted in that. Whatever he's calling us to give up, it's for our good. So that our joy might be complete and that we might be further found in him. Amen? Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll, uh, we'll close our time here with a, another song.
Father, we say thank you that you are more than enough. Everything we have and everything that we need is found in you. We are fully free. We are fully found when we are in you. And Lord, we thank you for this this passage that reminds us of, of the cost of the sacrifice. The things we have to leave behind in order to follow Jesus with the reckless abandon that he calls us to. And sometimes that, that's a struggle. Sometimes there are those, those big things, and, and, and maybe for some of us, there have been those, those crucial moments in our lives, those forks in the road, so to speak, where, where we had to, to leave something pretty big behind. And, and, and maybe we've done that. Maybe there are some right now, there is a big thing looming on the horizon that we're going to have to leave behind. And, and <laughs> it's a struggle right now. We're wrestling with it. There's some belief, but maybe there's some unbelief right now. Maybe there are some small things right now, Lord. There are areas of our lives that, that we're kind of leaving untouched. We're, we're kind of hiding in the corner and hoping you won't notice. And yet you're pointing at it and you're saying, we need to deal with that. That's something to leave behind in order that you would fully follow and that your joy would be further complete. Lord, I pray for each one, whatever the situation might be, help us to come before you in this moment openly, honestly, allowing you to search our hearts, allowing your word to continue to cross-examine us And we are so thankful, Jesus, that you are our example, that you are a model for us, not just in your amazing teaching here, but in what you did for us. You gave everything up. And we don't fully comprehend the totality of that. We don't fully understand the the fullness of that cost. But we're so thankful that you did it, that you gave yourself up so that we could be forgiven, we could be free, that we could experience the fullness of joy that you intend for us to experience in this life. And we look forward to that joy being made all the more a hundredfold greater when we see you and behold you in your glory, when we see you face to face in eternity. Lord, thank you for this time. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Matt. (laughs) Um, So we're going to be closing with the song Christ is Enough. Um, If you guys want to stand up again to sing along, that would be fabulous. Um, Verse 2 The start of verse 2 says, Christ my all in all, the joy of my salvation. And this hope will never fail. Heaven is our home. And that's just what Pastor Matt was talking about. Christ is the joy of our salvation. And so I'd encourage you guys to sing this out and to ponder and think on the words as we also declare that I have decided to follow Jesus. Christ is my reward.
going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Uh, something I've certainly missed and uh, it's good, it's good um, where was I going with that? Woo. <laughs> no turning back um, Christ is enough and I pray and hope that, uh, that this time this morning that we shared has been a reminder of that, that he is more than enough for us um, if, if just in our time here, if the Lord is speaking to you and you feel like you don't want to leave here without doing some business and, and taking some time to reflect and uh, to pray. Um, I'd encourage you just as we wrap things up here, feel free to, to come on up to, to the front here. We've got, we've got lots of space out here. Uh, come see me or, uh, or just even if where you are, if there's somebody you just want to pull aside and just chat for a few minutes and, and maybe pray together, um, take advantage of that opportunity. You don't want to have you leave this place without having the opportunity to just further do business with the Lord and respond. I want to encourage us as we dismiss our time here with some words that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. This is at the end of his first letter, and he said these things. As for the rich in this present age, and I would say that would include all of us. I know sometimes we don't think we're all that rich, but given where we are in the world in comparison to, to many other places, we are so blessed and we have so much. And so for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but instead on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life 
He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day today. Have a great uh, week ahead. Um, just want to let you know that we've got an opportunity. If you are able to stick around for a little bit uh, here after the service, we've got an opportunity to serve. Pastor Caleb's looking for about, I'll say, five to ten people. If you could stick around for maybe 15 minutes or so to just move around a few things as we get our final setup for VBS, which starts tomorrow. Um, so if some people would be willing to just come forward after the service to help with that, Pastor Caleb will give you some direction in terms of what to do and where to go. But uh, God bless you. Have a great week. Please be in prayer for us here at the church this week as we have week one of VBS. And we're praying and trusting that God's going to do some amazing things. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.